And they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord, God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord called, Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Look at this passage carefully, and you find these words stand out, jump out to us over and over again. Again, that word is the word they. Their eyes were open. They knew they were naked. They sewed together fig leaves and made themselves aprons. They heard the voice of God walking in the garden. They hid themselves. They, their eyes were open. They knew they were naked. Huh? They made themselves aprons. They heard God's voice walking in the garden. They hid themselves. I want to tell us this morning that God knows where you are. God knows where you are. God knows everything. There is nothing that God does not know. The Bible says he knows us. We are wonderfully and intricately made that he even knows the number of hairs on our heads. Psalm 139 7 says he knows our down city and our uprising. He knows our going out, knows our coming in. He knows what kind of people we are. Mm. No matter how we dress up, no matter how we smell, no matter how we smile, no matter how we imitate, God knows what kind of person we are. No matter how we cloak that in good works, Huh? No matter how we pretend that everything is all right, God knows what kind of person we are. Not just how we are on Sunday. Yeah, he knows how we are on Saturday night. And Friday night. And Monday morning. And everything in between. Tell somebody, he knows where we are. He knows every hurt, knows every pain, knows every disappointment, knows every heartache, knows every trial, knows every circumstance, knows every situation. There is nothing that God does not know. Nothing catches God by surprise. And the fact that we know that God knows everything ought to govern the way we act. Hmm? The fact that we know that the eyes of the Lord are in every place, sees everything, both the good and the evil, ought to restrain us in some of the things that we think some of the things that we say and some of the ways that we act. The fact of the matter that God knows our hearts, y'all in here? Knows our hearts' desire, knows our thoughts before they are formed in our mind and the words that we speak before they come out of our mouths or to restrain us in the things that we say. The fact that there is no hiding place 
from God or to caution us before we drive over to the dark side of town. I'm, I'm, I came, I'm, I'm trying to help you this morning. The fact that God knows everything ought to make us conscious and careful of what we think, what we say, and what we do. Yet, in spite of all of that, in spite of knowing all of that, in spite of knowing all of that, there is still something on the inside of us that causes us to try to bypass God, to try to sidestep God, and circumvent what God's will is in our lives. We know we shouldn't be doing it. Yeah. We know we shouldn't be saying it. We know we shouldn't be going there. But something on the inside of us that when we desire to do good, evil is always present and what we ought not to do, we do. And what we ought to do, we don't. What is it? What is it that moves us out of the will of God? What is it that prompts us to tell God, I know you know, but I'm going to do it anyway and I'm going to ask for forgiveness later. God knows where you are. He knows what we are thinking. He knows what we're going to say, do, because he knows everything. God, you don't matter if I point, do you? God knows where you are. He knows. Let's move to Genesis 3 so we can find out why we do what we do, knowing that God knows everything. Genesis 3 reveals to us the subtlety of Satan and the devices that he uses. It reveals to us that man is incapable are walking the street of righteousness without the guidance of God's divine grace. It shows to us that no matter how strong we think we are, the devil is on our track. Y'all in here? It cautions us to be careful not to take God's word and transcribe it and refine it and manipulate it to please ourselves. In Genesis 1 and 2, everything is okie-dokie. Yes, it is. God said in Genesis 1, when he got through with everything, he said it is you know the story. And you move into Genesis chapter 2. And God starts giving everything his order of existence. The sun to rule by day, moon to rule by night. Gave Adam the capacity to name every living thing. So Adam was a wise man. Y'all follow me? And then he looked at Adam and saw Adam in his loneliness and said, and I might not even get to this thing today, and said it is not good for man to be alone. And then God made from Adam woman. And everything is fine in Eden. And God says to Adam, be fruitful and multiply. And then he says to Adam, only one thing. And that one thing will mess you up every time. Hmm. One thing. Thou shalt not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good 
and evil. But man created in the image and likeness of God, man, of whom God said is very good. Man chose to become self-centered, self-seeking, and self-willed. And he chose to disobey God. And when man disobeyed God, man sinned. And when man sinned, man fell from his original standing with his creator. And Genesis 3 centers around three questions that God asked Adam and that God is asking us today. Number one, where are you? Think about that. Where are you? Number two, who told you you were naked? Number three, what have you done? Now, when we ask a question, we ask it because we are lacking information. But when God asks a question, he already knows the answer. And the question is designed to show us what we are in our relationship with him. You remember, he asked Elijah, why are you up here up under this juniper tree? Hmm? He asked the question to show us our relationship with God. Adam sinned. Adam fell. Adam is out of fellowship with God. Adam is trying to establish himself in the concept of his own righteousness. Adam tries to cloak himself, to conceal himself, to hide the fact that he was not where he was supposed to be. And so when God comes to Adam and asks him, where art thou, Adam? Adam now stands ashamed before God. Bible says the first effect of the sin was the realization of the shame. It says their eyes were open and they knew that they were naked and they made fig leaves and shaped them into aprons. Nakedness here has more to do than with bodily reference. It is used to show a reversal of what happened to Adam and Eve in Genesis 2 and 25. In Genesis 2 and 25, when God made Adam and then made Eve and brought Eve to Adam, the Bible says they were both naked and not ashamed. Something has happened between Genesis 3 and 7 and Genesis 3 and 25 that alters or changes the concept of the word naked. In the Hebrew tongue, naked has three meanings. The first one found in Genesis 2 and 25 where God said they were both naked and not ashamed means that they had no clothes on, but there is no shame. In Exodus 20, when Moses come down from Sinai and Israel's down worshiping the golden calf, the Bible said, and Moses saw the nakedness of the people. There the word nakedness means open, shameless misbehavior. Here in Genesis 3, the word naked means helpless. Helpless and hopeless. Something happened between 225 and 3 and 7. What happened? Adam disobeyed God, and now Adam is helpless and hopeless. When he looks at where he is now compared to where he was, he realized he could not get back where he was. And all of us in here know 
that when we disobey God by ourselves, we cannot get back where we were. So they stand before God. Something else happened. I believe that when God made Adam, remember now, Adam is made in the image and likeness of God. He's made in a state of innocence. He is able to see God face to face. He's able to talk to God face to face. That means that Adam had a glory of God all around him. Uh, innocence. Innocence calls us not to look at ourselves. It calls us to look at God. Babies are not ashamed of their nakedness. Children, young children are not ashamed of their nakedness. They only become ashamed of their nakedness when we remind them that it is a sin. Adam, where are you? Not where you are geographically or positionally. Where are you spiritually? See, God saw Adam when he was talking to Eve as he talked to Satan. God knows everything. God could have stopped them in the garden, but he didn't. Why? Because Adam had to be tested. And a test is not designed to show you what you don't know. It's designed to show you what you do know. Come on in here. The test that they give in school is not designed to show you your ignorance. It's designed to show you your knowledge that you have obtained and retained the information to make you function as you ought to function. And so the test is here. So that Adam could know that if he obeyed God, he would be blessed. If he disobeyed God, he would be cursed. The words of God to Adam were this. The day thou eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. Well, yet I'm in shame. I'm exposed. I make fig aprons to clothe my nakedness. Adam is not only trying to hide from God. He's trying to hide from himself. They're trying to hide from each other because the glory is gone. And because the glory is gone, it reminds me that I'm not standing where God made me to stand. And because I'm not standing where God made me to stand, I am ashamed of what I have done to move me out of that position. Sin will always awaken within us the spirit of guilt and shame. Guilt and shame. Now, guilt reminds us that we're not in fellowship with God. Shame reminds us that there's a disharmony within ourselves. Shame always points the mirror at us. I'm ashamed not because of what I feel about myself. I'm ashamed because of what other people feel about me. Where are you at? I'm making fig leaves. I'm going to hide myself. And everything appeared to be fine. The word is appear to be. Because, see, people can go for years in their sin. Huh? Appearing to be fine. But God, something else happened to Adam now. I, I, <laughs> something else. When Adam sinned, Adam developed a conscience. Ah, that's something to think about. He didn't need a conscience before because he was walking like God told him to walk. But when he sinned, he developed a conscience. A conscience is God's mercy deposited in our selfishness. It's, it's God's mercy deposited in our selfishness. Uh, it's God's mercy because it reminds us that we've done something wrong. So Adam is ashamed. He's in fig leaves and they're moving along. 
How long was it between the fall and the appearance of God? The Bible does not say. But they clothe themselves. And even though we clothe ourselves in fig leaves of good things, in fig leaves of coming to church every Sunday, in the fig leaves of preaching and teaching, in the fig leaves of paying our tithes and offering. In the fig leaves of doing ministry. In the fig leaves of self-glorification. Uh, God has a way of showing up in time to expose our nakedness. The Bible says all of our self-righteousness is as filthy rags in the sight of God. And so God comes to Adam in the cool of the day. Adam, why art thou? You may be asking like I'm asking, why is it that God had to call out to Adam? I believe that in his innocence that Adam was waiting for God to show up so he could communicate with him. So he could talk to him. Are you waiting for God to show up yet? Adam, huh? Adam was waiting for God to show up. But now Adam realizes that the fellowship has been broken. And so when God comes, Adam does what every sinner does in the presence of God. He fled. He tried to hide himself. They are alienated from God. The relationship has died. And they run at the sound of God's voice. But church, write this down. Running from God is never the answer. First of all, David said, where are you going to run? Say, where can I go from that presence? If I go up to heaven... You're there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. God says in Jeremiah 23, 23 and 24, am I a God at hand and not a God afar off? Can he any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him? God calls to Adam, where art thou? Adam, hide. It's the sound of God. Where well, art thou, Adam? Is designed to convey to Adam the fact that Adam is now in dangerous territory. Is to convey to Adam the fact that Adam is now exposed and without armor. It is designed to convey to Adam the fact that without fellowship with God. You will die. I say it. Without fellowship with God, you will die. Your name can be on the church record for 75 years. Have no fellowship with God, you're going to die. Not just die physically, you're going to die spiritually, and you're going to die eternally. Where are you, Adam? Look at where you've fallen to. Look at what listen to other people cause in your life. Listen at what self-will and self-centeredness and self-motivation will cause you to do. All of our trouble, all of our problems have been caused by ourselves. Look what Adam says. I was afraid. I was naked. I hid myself. We've already established that first of all, we cannot hide from God. Secondly, you cannot hide from yourself. No matter how we cloak it over, we know in the chambers of our hearts 
what we have done. And they hid themselves because the fig leaves would not suffice. God says to Adam, who told you you were naked? What is it caused you to be ashamed and to fear me? Compare where you are now in disobedience to where you were in obedience. Compare how you feel now that you have tasted of that which I forbid you to taste compared to where you were before you took the bite. Are you taking inventory while I'm preaching? Are you doing the research in your life right now while I'm talking to you? Do you hear the words that come out of my mouth? It's easy for us to look at Adam and say, oh, Adam, what have you done? Oh, Adam, shame on you. Oh, Adam, you deserve what you got. But can I tell you that we are the Adam? <laughs> Where are you? I hid myself because I was naked. Adam saying he was naked, saying that he was helpless and he was hopeless. But God has a solution to Adam's problem. God provides the atonement for sin. The word atonement in the Hebrew text means at at one o n e met with God. At one with God. Adam has fallen. Adam's out of fellowship. Adam is naked. Adam is hopeless. Adam can't find his way back. Adam has no clue. But God has the answer. And so Adam come, God comes to Adam, and what's the first thing God does with Adam? Look at this. God does not come to Adam with a sword in his hand, does not come with bolts of lightning, does not come with a roaring thunder, does not come with a legion of angels. He comes like he had always come. Still voice moving in the garden. In the cool of the day. And Adam stands before God naked and ashamed. Where are you? Where are you? Is it called divine justice? Because sin has to be dealt with. Where are you? Is it call of divine sorrow? Because it grieves God when we sin. Where are you is also a call of the divine love because God knows that if he does not come to our rescue, nobody and nothing can help us. Somebody ought to say, thank you, Jesus. Instead, God comes to Adam. God gives Adam an opportunity to confess his sin, to be established and restored to God, and Adam blew it. He blew it. He did what we do. He blew it. He said to God, the woman that you gave me. Huh? Didn't he say that? Say, he said that. The woman that you gave me, she gave me, I did eat. And then when God asked Eve, what have you done? The woman Blame the serpent. In essence, the woman blamed God too because God made everything. And people today are using the same lame excuse. Oh, yes, we are. I say, yes, we are. We are still blaming other folks for the shape we're in. 
We are still looking back in our past. Can I talk to you folks who are still living in the past? That excuse carried no weight at all with God. Why? Because Satan can only tempt. He cannot force. Do you remember Flip Wilson? Devil made me do it. That's a lie on top of a lie. The devil can't make us do anything. Can I wake you up this morning and tell you that the reason the devil cannot make you do anything is you don't belong to him? No. If you've been saved, you're a child of the king. You don't belong to him. Adam chose to sin. Eve chose to sin. Let me tell you the steps of falling to sin. First of all, she knew she wasn't supposed to have it. Huh? But she looked at it anyway. And she saw it was good. And since she saw it was good, she took it. And when she took it, she ate it. And when she ate it, she gave it to Adam. The Bible said, who was there with her? He was with her. Did I say that right? He was there with her. <clears throat> Sin is always a choice. But the consequences of sin is that it would always leave us with guilt, shame, and fear of God. But God's a merciful God. He's a merciful God. <clears throat> Remember now, the, com the, the commandment says, the day you eat, Thou shalt surely die. So Adam has already experienced one death in that he is spiritually separated from God. And even though he lived a long time, he's already taken the first step to his physical dying. He began to die physically the moment he ate. But God is a merciful God, so God will save him from eternal death. And so Adam now stands before God naked and ashamed. And the Bible says God made clothing suitable for Adam <coughs> and Eve. <coughs> well, the Bible says he made it of animal skin. Hmm. So if he had to cover them with animal skin. <coughs> The curse on Adam dying takes place first on the animal that God slew to make the clothes for Adam. The animal that died in Adam's place is a spiritual picture of the Lamb of God that died before the foundation of the world. Before, oh, did you get that? Before God made Adam who sinned, he had already decided in divine wisdom that Christ would die for the sinner. Now let me close by saying that God goes a step further in his mercy. The Bible says he puts Adam and Eve out of the garden to prevent them from taking of the tree of life and living forever as a sinner. God came after Adam. Adam did not go to God. Jesus said, 
No man come to me except he be drawn of the Father. <clears throat> and he who comes to me, I will not turn aside, but I will receive him unto myself. Yes, God is in the business of pursuing sinners. Yes. God knows where we are. Say that. He knows, he knows. where we are. And he will never leave us where we are. But he will come where we are to take us where we need to be. He will come to us in our confusion, come to us in our sorrow, come to us in our sickness, come to us in our circumstances. But he will never leave us where he finds us. He will always take us where he wants us to be. And the reason God knows where we are is because he has been where we are now. He came in the form of flesh, lived in this world, went through the same thing we are going through. The Bible says he was tempted in all things as we are tempted, yet without sin. And you may say, yeah, but he was God, but he was also human. So he said, I came to be an example to you. If I, Christ, in the power of Father, can live a sinless life, let me come down where you at, you can too. Don't let the devil fool you. Don't let nobody handcuff you. You can be what God says you can be. All you got to do is shake off self, stand on the word, say, come on in me, Lord, lead me, follow, guide me, I'm yours. So the question that we need to ask ourselves this morning is, do we want to stay where we are? Do we want to stay where we are? Are we tired? I'm going through the same old thing, doing the same old thing, acting the same old way, living beneath the privilege that God has given us. We serve a God who has all power in his hand. Why do we want to go along like we are? Listen to me this morning. God knows where we are. He knows how we got there. He knows how long we have been in it. But he also knows how to get us out of it. Yeah, take my yoke upon you and learn of me and you shall find rest unto your souls. Are you tired of being weak? Are you tired are wrestling with the same sin every day? Are you tired of being powerless? I got good news for you. You don't have to stay that way. Jesus died on the cross of Calvary to make things right between us and God. The Bible says he is the justifier. And the word justifier means he makes us right with God. How can he make it right with God? He paid the price for our sin. And because he obeyed God, God has highly exalted him and given him a name that's above every name. That means that you can use that name right where you are now to get where God wants you to be. All you have to do is practice with him. Just call his name. Just, just, just call his name. So, Lord, you know where I am. I need your help today. You know where I'm sitting. I need your help today. You know what I'm wrestling with. You know my down sitting. You know my stumbling. You know my fault. And Jesus, 
Father, I stretch my hand to thee, no other. Oh, bless his name. Bless his name. Bless his name. The Bible says God is able to the utmost to save. If you have to reach way down, he is able. The doors of the church are open. You may come by Lella Christian experience at Camp for Baptism. You don't have to stay where you are. God knows where you are. He's here to help you become what he has called you to be. And if you step out by faith, I'm a witness that God will change you. Any witness in here? Anybody know God will change you? That he'll find you where you are and start a process that will bring a change in your life. Now, don't listen to the devil. He's telling you right now that you're not as bad as some folks, but you're still bad enough to go to hell. Yeah. Y'all listening to me this morning? He may tell you you got time to work on that. The driver said today is the day of salvation. He may tell you, listen to what I got to say, but the Bible said today you hear God's voice, hearken not your heart. Harden not your heart. Harden not your heart. I'm begging with you. I'm pleading with you. I'm trying to get you to see that God is able to change your life. But you got to come to him. You got to step up by faith and trust him this morning. All of us have gone astray. But thank God for Jesus. Somebody said thank God for Jesus. Who came down to redeem us and to restore us. And you can be restored today. Now don't sit there and look at me like that. Because I don't have a heaven to put you in. And I can't keep you out of here. But I know somebody who can. And I just try to explain to you who he is. But if you don't know who he is, let me just sum it up in three words. Jesus Christ, Savior. Jesus Christ, Savior. And if you come to him today, he will save you. Right where you are, he will save you. Won't you come today? Maybe you're in the vicinity. You just recently moved here. You're looking for a church home. We extend the invitation to become a part of Food Week Church family. Maybe you're here just for temporary and you're going back, but you want to worship with a facility, with an organization, with a family. We invite you to come under watch care. You can come today. Or maybe you're saying, I want, I want this man, Jesus, in my life. I want him to change me, but this is not really where I want to worship. I, I want to go back to my mom's church, or grandmama's church. That's all right. That's all right. Just come today. We will take you in. We'll give you a letter. You can go to worship wherever you want to worship. All we're concerned about is their name being written on the Lamb's Book of Life, knowing for a fact that you're in the kingdom of God. If God wants to call you home right now, would you be ready? You can be ready in Christ. Won't you come today? We're waiting. You don't have to stay where you are. You can come over to the Lord's side. God bless you. Thank you.